from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English. This is our third program, Episode 3, Segment 1. Ramping Up Your English is for English language learners from all language backgrounds who've already begun the process of learning English as their second language. It's a program for people of all ages. If you're seeking greater English proficiency, this program is designed to help you reach that goal. If you know what this is, then you already know about our first theme. Your knowledge of trains and railroads will help you elevate your English for a number of language functions. In English, this is called a spike. Spikes have been used for years to hold the rails onto cross pieces of track called railroad ties. Spikes are still used today in track construction and maintenance. Thousands of strikes were once used to build the Transcontinental Railroad, linking the East and West Coast in the United States. If this program is going too fast, like a runaway train, I suggest watching episodes one and two by going to archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. You can also access all episodes of Ramping Up Your English at letscreate.org. We have a few things to review today from previous programs, but first, we're going to see this short video clip about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The video clip will prepare you for the language work we'll be doing later in this episode. For now, just watch and enjoy this video, Early Rails. We're going backward in time today back to when railroads first began to be built in the United States, and even before that. It was once all about water, and America was blessed with many navigable rivers. People and goods flocked to boats to carry them distances. To fill in between rivers and to connect them, canals were built. Even George Washington invested in a canal to move heavy cargo to markets. Wagons pulled by teams of mules and horses were still used. Those who controlled the animal teams were called teamsters. Their union is still active today, although for different work. Soon railroads began spreading quickly, moving freight and people faster than canals. Ten years before the Civil War, in 1850, Railroads were firmly established in the Northeast and began trickling into what was then called the Northwest. By 10 years after the Civil War, railroads reached west beyond the Mississippi River and the Transcontinental Railroad allowed passengers to go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean in San Francisco. A big step in that direction was construction of the Eads Bridge in St. Louis and it still spans the Mississippi River. All this railroading was made possible by the steam engine. Fuel is burned to heat water, which expands as steam and creates power to move pistons. A system using steam locomotives requires frequent stops for taking on water. No water, no steam. No steam, no power. Steam locomotives are in constant need of attention. Those who spend a lot of time with them say they seem to be alive. A steam train requires an engineer and a fireman in a locomotive and a brakeman in the early days, they had to move from car to car atop the train to set the brakes by hand. Each train also had a conductor. The passenger cars on early trains were simple wagons with seats. 
not padded seats like this coach. Building the Transcontinental Railroad was that generation's equivalent of landing on the moon. No such engineering challenge had ever been attempted. Union Pacific began laying tracks at Omaha, Nebraska, westward. The Central Pacific began at Sacramento, building eastward. The Union Pacific was able to lay track quickly in the flatness of the Great Plains, but the work was still backbreaking. The workers actually building the railroad were mostly Irish immigrants, eager to earn wages. I was born a hard-driving railroad man. I was born a hard-driving railroad man. I was born with this nine-pound hammer in my hand. I was born. Building east from the Sacramento Valley was much harder, and people from European descent were much more interested in digging for gold than building a railroad. The solution to the labor problem came from Asia. Chinese workers came, already organized into work crews, called gangs. Their ability to work amazingly hard and peacefully was legendary. Their dogged, patient work allowed the railroad to bore through mountains and lay track at high elevations. Even at Donner Lake, famous for the Overland Trail disaster that included cannibalism. Building tunnels through the mountains was especially dangerous. It involved using explosives like nitroglycerin, but the Chinese workers were good at this. The workers were lowered to the mountainside in these baskets. They set the explosives and the baskets were raised so they would escape the blast. When the baskets failed to raise, that was called going to hell in a handbasket, a saying still in use today. The Central Pacific finally broke out of the mountains and laid track across the parching desert of Nevada. It was dry and terribly hot but it was mostly flat, allowing Central Pacific to lay track more quickly. They met the Union Pacific at Promontory, Utah in 1869, where Leland Stanford drove in the last spike, the Golden Spike. Here, the ceremony is repeated by descendants of those Chinese railroad builders. The Transcontinental Railroad made it possible to travel from coast to coast in a matter of days instead of months. The whistle of a steam locomotive became a soundtrack of life to millions in cities and small towns alike. The Overland Railroad was soon joined by other Transcontinental Railroads, providing a link made of steel and steam to keep our country together. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. This concludes episode three, segment one. We'll be back with segment two right after this.